pitching deck structure that we gave you, you will have an opportunity to pitch and they will give you constructive criticism. So we just want you guys to have value once you leave here, you know, and so that you can tomorrow, if there's a pitching session you have, you'll ace it. Um, so let me not waste any further time and Abu, please. Hi everyone, good afternoon. Um, yeah, so I normally do, I, I can talk for two hours on this particular topic, um, but I've got five minutes. So let me first start by introducing myself. My name's Abu Kassim, I run Josie Angels. We're an angel investor network based in Johannesburg. There are 29 of us in the network. We've made 45 early stage investments, typically into tech businesses, but we have invested in non-tech businesses as well and it's typically equity-like investments. So if you've ever gone to a bank, they don't want to speak to you, it's because they use debt instruments um, and then we use equity instruments. The, um, in terms of my message to you today, there, there are four key points that I wanted to get across to you. And I'm gonna be speaking from an investor pitch perspective. So the first message is think of it as a relationship, right? When we invest in a business, we become a partner in your business. One of the things we ask ourselves is, can I work with you? Can we work alongside? Do we have synergies and do we get along? Remember that the African startup is an eight to 12 year journey. It's not what you read about in these American books where these guys are blitz scaling and going from zero to a, a billion valuation, a unicorn, in six months. That doesn't happen on the continent. So it's an eight to 12 year journey. How are we gonna get along for the next 12 years? Relationship, number one. Number two, less is more. And what I mean by that is I could have come up here and talked you through 20 or 30 points, but I'm only talking you through four because that's what I want you to take away with you today. So less is more. That also informs the way you speak. So Leabo is going to talk about your, your, how you articulate yourself. This, it, how you speak is much more important than what you say. And there's been research that 93% of the message that you're communicating is not the words you use, but how you speak. Yeah? So less is more. Number three is keep it visual. Uh, so I, I don't know what the format is like today, but when you're doing an investor pitch, the attention should be on you, right? Um, not reading through all the slides that are in the background, and you should definitely not be reading through the slides, right? Um, as soon as you turn your back to your audience, we lose the connection, right? So you, I want eye I, I, I contact, communication, we need to be connected all the time. And they're not connected to you if they're reading your slides. There's a little box in the middle of your brain that all the inputs, your ears, your eyes, your nose, it processes all of that. And it can only unfortunately process one at a time, or it's only good at processing one at a time. So I can either listen to you as the presenter, or I can read your slide deck, right? So keep it visual. And then the last thing is everything's relative. And I'm gonna give you two bits of research. So the first is happiness. Lots of research around social media and how social media is actually bad for our psychology. All we see is snippets of people's lives, the happy parts. And we think, why is our life not like that? Yeah. Um, so our happiness is relative to everyone else's happiness. Wealth, relative as well. So there was, there was a question raised if I gave you $2 million in 1900, would you take that or $5 million today? Most people took the $2 million. You know why? Because it made you part of the 1% of them, even smaller, maybe half a percent of the wealthiest people in the world. Everyone wants to be the wealthiest relative to one another. But the utility value, was nothing in 1900. What could you buy with $2 million, right? $5 million today gives you a lot of utility value. You can use that. 
And surprise, surprise, investors assess your opportunity on a relative basis, right? So just keep that in mind when you're engaging with an investor. So number one, uh, it's a relationship. Number two, less is more. Number three, keep it visual. And number four, just be in mind that I'm assessing you on a relative basis. Cool. That's it. Hi, guys. Thank you so much for coming. My name is Dia Bosteto. I am a an uh, economics reporter. I'm also an anchor and a TV presenter. Um, currently, I am in the space of uh, producing a show called SME on Point with Diabo Seto. Um, it's basically a very small feature that features small businesses like your businesses. I'm sure if you watch SABC a lot, um, it's something that you have encountered and uh, seen. So why am I here today? I'm here today because I'm interested in hearing stories of entrepreneurs and uh, small businesses. But I get often disappointed in how they approach me, right? You may have an excellent idea. You have this amazing idea that can change the course of South Africa, that can even change the world. But how you pitch it to me could actually make me off it, not one to take it. So today we're going to look at the methods of pitching what should be in your pitch when you pitch to a media institution, not just to myself, but any media institution. I'm going to give you the lowdown on what we look for as journalists, what time you should be sending your pitch, right? And uh, what should be contained in your pitch. You know, does your date of birth matter? Maybe it doesn't, maybe it does. Um, uh, the, the most important thing is that a lot of people when they get that five minutes opportunity to be, for instance, on SME On Point or, or Morning Live, a lot of entrepreneurs miss the opportunity because they do not know how to structure their messaging very well. Remember, a typical interview on um, radio or TV is about five to seven minutes long. That is the amount of time that you have to tell 50 or 60 million South Africans, let's say 40 million who watch SABC, about your business, about how it's changing your business. You may have the great idea, but if you don't refine how you speak, if, you don't, if you're not pointed in saying, what is it that your product or your company, what sort of problem it is solving, you may miss the opportunity completely. The attention span of a, of a viewer is very limited and everybody is competing for it. So when you are watching TV, think about yourself when you're watching TV and someone starts saying, um, uh, um, for let's say about a few seconds, what is the first thing that you're going to do? Change channels. When someone is not dressed appropriately for TV, let's say they have maybe hair like mine, okay? Very curly hair, and then, but it's blonde, and I've got little butterflies on it. What happens to the attention that you are giving to me? You start wondering, why is that curl like that? And then, but why did she wear that shirt? Let's say I'm wearing a shirt that is exposing my cleavage, or I'm wearing a very short skirt and I'm sitting and my thighs are exposed. Already, you know, whatever I was going to say to you, you're not listening to it. You are first going to um, ask yourself a lot of questions about what was I thinking when I wore all those, all those clothes. So um, the point of today is to give you pointers of what works, right? Um, uh, if you do get that opportunity, maybe as you walk out here, I'm hoping that the tips that I'm going to share with you, they'll help you to say, okay, I'll take that opportunity to do an interview and actually ace it. So I'm hoping that you indulge me a little later on. I have prepared something, a guide that you'll be able to take home with you, uh, that you'll be able to use, and, and hopefully it will be uh, great for your businesses. Thank you. Thank you guys uh, for that. Um, so before we actually start, I just wanted to ask two of you just to tell us the challenges that you've personally experienced when um, either creating a pitch deck or pre pitching in front of investors. So at least we know some of the challenges that you guys have experienced and maybe um, see how then we can um, address those challenges. Um, who is ready? 
a one, two. Will you come later? <laughs> you can come on stage, please. All right, thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, my name is Joseph Nyamarwata, and our business is SouthAfricanInfluences.com. But prior to starting this business, I've had opportunity to start other startups and uh, sharing some of my challenges pitching to investors. I think the biggest one is that when you start a, a new business, you don't have data, right? Especially in Africa. So you don't have enough information that you can use to back up your idea. So how do you go about sort of making a case for a startup in Africa when you don't have that information because we usually resort to using information from the US or the UK where there's enough information. Thank you. Um, hello guys. Uh, my name is Tabiso Matsaung. Uh, well, at the moment, I'm still working on an idea. I'm an aspiring entrepreneur. I failed quite a lot, so many times. And pitching is one of my biggest challenges. Well, when you write a pitch deck, so you have to prepare your slides there, and there's so much that you've written on the slides. Now, the thing comes, the, the, the only challenges that I'm facing is I have to remember, um, I, I try to remember everything that I wrote on that pitch deck, which is quite difficult. Uh, so what I, I'd like to, 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 to gain from you guys to know is like, how do I um, um, summarize everything for, for investors and also me to understand? Yes, thank you. sanitizing the screen <laughs> it's something else eh? okay um so given that um i think well myself included um speaking in front of people is really nerve-wracking um especially people that will give you money you know you need to say the right thing at this right time so it is nerve-wracking it's not necessarily because you don't know what you want or what you do it's because it's just nerve-wracking <laughs> so based on those challenges so right now i'm a big, i was expecting the pitch decks to be ready by now but we'll just give them out as they speak so right now they'll just be telling us maybe the things that you need to address how your pitch decks need to look like the things that you need to talk about just the right things just basics um that you need to know in order to pitch in front of investors and then we'll just give each one of you guys pitch decks while as they speak so you guys can follow through as they speak and after this this is going you need to listen now because we are you guys are will be grouped and you will be given a chance to pitch in front of them <laughs> So I don't know which one can start. Ladies first. Uh, I'm not sure. You can just start. Okay. Okay, Abu can start. Yeah. So uh, apart from the, the four messages that I mentioned earlier, there were two additional areas that I wanted to get across, two additional messages that I wanted to get across. So the first one is know your investor. Get a good sense of who the person is across the table from you if you're pitching at a coffee shop or in an audience like this, right? Know the, know the people you're pitching to because they're going to be the partners in your business and you need to then position your, <coughs> your content accordingly. So that's the first point. Um, and it's, it's a concept I call reverse due diligence. So often you pitch to someone and you get a good sense of who, or what they want, whether they're keen or not. And then it's a one-way conversation. Send me your uh, sh shareholders agreement. Send me this, send me this, send me this. And you don't then ask for anything in return. All you're doing is sending stuff. Stop and my suggestion is do your due diligence on the person investing in, in you. 
the reason being is they're going to become your partners. It is a marriage. Um, but when things don't go well, it's worse than a divorce, right? It's going to pull your company apart. So do your reverse due diligence on the person investing. And the way you go about it is ask the person, can I, can I speak to one of your other portfolio companies? Can I just get a sense of what support you've offered them, right? The second one, and this is something we often see, is companies saying, I've got the best idea, but I don't want to tell you anything until you sign an NDA, right? Um, and it's a problem for me for many reasons. No, number one, NDAs, it's a legal agreement, right? So it's time consuming, inherently time consuming. You're going to send me a document. I'm going to read through it, make some changes, possibly share it with a lawyer. He's going to make some changes. We're just going to go around and around until all the changes are accepted, right? Once we're happy, we all sign. Second part of that process is someone amongst your network has breached that NDA, right? But you don't know who. So you've got to go on this paper trail and, and go and investigate who it was that actually breached the NDA. Again, time consuming. All of this time is time away from your business, all right? Number three, the third step in that whole process is we get into some sort of litigation war. You're taking me to court because I've breached my NDA. Again, resources, time and money that you are wasting in, in going through that whole process. The fourth reason is more something personal from an investor's perspective. So I see 150 applications for funding on a monthly basis, right? When Uber was started, there were many other companies that were doing cab hailing, ride hailing, Lyft sharing. Lyft was one of them. Um, so what actually happens when we sign an NDA is we restrict our value that we can have in your business. So let's say I've signed an NDA with you. Um, we don't go anywhere. We don't do a deal, but I'm still subject to the NDA. I, I'm then approached by you and you've got a very similar idea. And I've got the, the best network to actually make that idea happen. But I've signed an NDA. I can't actually work with you. So it restricts our value that we can bring to, to your business. And just to take that a step further, so capital is often the starting point of our conversation, but actually there are two other assets that I'm going to bring to your business that are much more important. Number one is networks, so I'm going to open up doors for you. And number two is knowledge. I'll help you with your decision making, hopefully because I know your industry. And those assets in the long run are going to be more valuable than the cash. But if I've signed an NDA, I can't then leverage my knowledge and my networks because I'm restricted. So what do you do? If, if you were investing into Coca-Cola today, if you were investing into Google today, they're never gonna show you the recipe, right? But they show you the results of that recipe. You know the algorithm, Google's algorithm, right? The results of that algorithm. You know the results of Coke's recipe. It's this fizzy drink that gives you energy and tastes good, right? So show them the results. Don't show them the secret recipe, okay? So that, those two things, know your investor, do your reverse due diligence, and then stay away from NDAs. All right, guys, by now you should have the, um, that little presentation in a printed format. I tried to make it as easy as possible. The reason I did it in a sort of a, a slide is so that it's something you can always refer to um, if you ever need to approach any of us for interviews, whether it's uh, TV, radio, or online podcasts. You know, podcasts are quite big. So I've decided to start with a little bit of a background um, to help you understand how the newsroom works to begin with, right? Um, by nature, we are spoiled for choice. On an average day, I get close to about two to, two, two to three hundred emails of people requesting me to interview them or cover their story. So, 
when you send your email, imagine the kind of pile that it is already coming into, right? And it needs to compete for my attention. And which means that your angle needs to be quite unique. It needs to be catchy, right? So a lot of people will say, interview request, fine, interview request for whatever, but it's best to write a motivation. Write a motivation can be in a word, uh, maybe converted into a PDF with your logo there on top to show that you're actually a company that exists, right? Uh, if you are a one-man shop, you must have a name or something. Interview request to have uh, Ms. Mathad Zetolamo interviewed on SME On Point, and then you would start with, hi, my name is, introduce yourself first so that I know who you are. My name is so-and-so. Um, I have an interest in being interviewed on your show. Um, and also, at least show me that you do watch the show, right? Sometimes a lot of people, <laughs> I will go to someone and travel as far as Pretoria. And I'm excited. I want to learn more about this person's business. I'm like, so do you know about SME and Point? And she says, no, actually, I haven't seen it. <laughs> I've traveled 45 kilometers for this person. They haven't seen, but they just want to be on TV at all costs. And I think it's an unfair relationship to start on. At least know who I am. And besides, what if this um, show that you want to be on it's not what your business should be on. You cannot just want to be on TV, on radio, at all costs, not knowing what my agenda is. Watch me enough to know that this is what I want my brand to be associated with. So that when you, when you even come to people like Abu, and maybe you talk about where your product has been featured, at least when they look us up, they can say SAPC is credible. Diablo doesn't have all these scandals flying around, you know. At least it puts a little bit value of, so my point is that it's important for you to do your own research about where you want to be featured. Why do you want to be featured? Do you even know why you want to be featured? What are you going to do with that interview afterwards? So you are on TV for five minutes, and then what's going to happen afterwards? What are you going to do with that? How are you going to use that airtime that you've been given wisely? So those are the kind of things that you should look at. So like I say, uh, currently because of COVID and the fact that newsrooms are very juniorized and we are losing jobs, I'm sure you all know that there have been 621 jobs that have been lost at the SABC. We thank God that I have survived, dodged the bullet for now at least. You can imagine that there is a lot of workload. So it is important that you make sure that you, know, you, you make your pitch concise understandable, try not to have a lot of mistake. Have someone else go through it. Read, have another pair of eyes go through that pitch before you send it to me. Fine, let's look at what should be in your pitch. So obviously research is critical because as I said earlier on, we get a lot of pitches and you want yours to stand out um, in, and make me interested in what you're sending out. So um, the most important thing, do you know what Diablo covers? Remember earlier on I told you that people don't, don't even know sometimes what I do. Do you know what I cover? Sometimes I get pitches where a person wants to do an interview on education. And I'm in economics and finance journalism and I also focus on entrepreneurship. So can you already see the disconnect how my thing is going to, how your pitch is already going to go to my trash because it's not what I'm looking for. And most of the time, uh, people don't do their homework. They just want to be on TV at all costs. Guys, please don't be like that. Do your homework. Do your homework so that it, 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 it just looks really trashy when you are so desperate. Don't be like that. You are valuable. The reason you have a business, the reason you are working as hard as you are is because you have value of something of value to offer. So don't cheapen it by how you behave. So it's important, take yourself seriously. You are the CEO, you are the founder, you are the managing editor. Take yourself seriously. And sometimes it will be um, rejected. It's okay, try again, try. We thrive on being tested sometimes, you know. Sometimes it's like, ah, oh, not this month, I'm not really looking at that. But, you know, try and try again, okay. Remember I said that uh, do your homework because you don't want your pitch to go to the wrong person. Uh, because it also helps you to customize your pitch to my interest. And we are attracted, in fact, we have 
an obsession with new ideas, new innovations, new stories. What is new about your business? What problem is it going to be solving? Right? Don't send me something that has been done over and over again and think because it's done by you, it's different. No. What is new? What, what problem are you solving? Right now in the country, we have so many economic challenges. We have uh, joblessness. We have, we have so many challenges, guys. So you need to, naturally, I would expect that your business, first of all, would be addressing a problem. Elevate that in your pitch, that this is the problem that we are um, addressing as a, as a business, and this is what we'd like to talk about. All right, let's talk about the buzzwords that you should be using. Like I said, what's so unique about your story and your idea or your innovation or your business? Who will it benefit? Put that in your pitch. Who is it going to benefit? Um, would it be interested, will the wider public be interested in it? Remember, there are about 30 to 40 million people watching what you are saying. Is it of interest to them? And how do you make it customizable to their interest? You do not want a person, like I said, who's watching, so, I'm not sure what she's talking about, change channel, let me watch Mojalab, or let me watch Mzansi Magic because I don't get what this person is talking about. You've already lost a client, a possible client. So it is important for you to make sure that the public is interested. And as I said earlier on, your business, your idea, your story should be, it should be appealing to the wider public. What motivated you to start your business? This is my personal interest, the story behind your story the story behind your business. That is the most powerful currency you have because you could have been a security guard. I recently featured a security guard um, who started as a security person at the mall and then he now owns a company that's valued at, a, has a turnover of 50 million, Abu. He employs about 1,200 people. He started in the malls. He was a security guard and how he started his business he started with one client. One client paid for the next client, and so forth. That story is interesting enough to have anyone glued to their screens, right? What is your story? Why did you start your business? Did it start because it was a side hustle? Because you needed to make extra money? Or did it start because in your community you realized that there was a need, there was a gap for something? That is the most powerful thing Think about the stories that you've read of people who have succeeded. It is their story of the why. Why did they start the business that has really gotten the attention of us um, media people? And lessons that you've learned so far. There's always someone that is following your footsteps. Always someone that wants to achieve what you have achieved. You should always be ready to share your success tips and lessons learned. Don't be stingy with them. Spread yourself, you know, help people along because you would be speaking to so many millions of people. Help them to achieve their note. They're not going to take your space. Share your lessons that I learned. Um, show the next person that you were where they are and you have succeeded today. So don't be stingy with your lessons and everything, um, advice that you have for entrepreneurs. The timing of your pitching, this is of importance. Don't, uh, guys. <laughs> We say there's never a good time to pitch a story, right? But there actually is because we work with deadlines. So mid-morning, around 10, 11, 12 is the best time to send us emails because if you're going to do it in the afternoon, we're chasing deadlines, right? My editor is saying, Diabo, I want that story by Ramaphosa. I want it now. It's my lead story. The last thing I want is someone badgering me about the email that they sent, you know, because... <laughs> So you need to be strategic. You need to be strategic. Send the email, allow the person to read the email and digest the email. Then you can follow up the next day. At least give them 24 hours. And then you write back, hi, Diabo, this is so-and-so. I'm just checking if you received my email about one, two, three, four. Please let me know when it is a convenient time to call you to discuss this. Don't just call me. We don't like calls, by the way. We don't like calls. Rather, email us. We really don't like to be called. <laughs> it's best to send an email because, like I said, at the end of the day, we are busy chasing deadlines. So sending an email also in the afternoon is really not encouraged, like I said, because we are, we are really, really busy. And, um, yeah, because 
I wanted to give you just a bit of the timing of the pitch. The methods of pitching, like I say, rather use email. Email remains number one. Don't call me, guys. I'm serious. Don't call to pitch. <laughs> Send an email and make sure that it's properly worded. All right. Um, and these are the kind of, I've listed there, the kind of things that should be contained in that email. Formally introduce yourself. Tell me what your story idea is or a proposal and when you are available for interviews. There's no point in you sending me a motivation. Then I say, yes, let's do it. And then you say, sorry, I'm not available. What are we doing? You know? And then lastly, when you do score that interview, guys, make sure that um, you have a key message that you send to the people that are watching you. What do you want them to know about you or your business? You need to craft that in a succinct, beautiful manner and that people will never forget it. Ideally, be media trained. If you can make that investment of being media trained, be on time for the interview. Um, if you are going to do um, virtual interviews, the standard things, make sure you've got good network, backgrounds that are work, a well-lit area, an area that does not have a lot of kids running around or the lawnmower from next door, try to get a good area, you come across better. And of course, make sure that you are dressed properly, even if it's a virtual interview. Okay, you can have your shorts at the bottom, but at the top, just make sure that you are dressed properly. And whatever you do, don't waste that five to seven minutes that I'm giving you in an interview. Use it to your advantage, because that could have people like Abu watching you. Also, oh, I think we saw you on that show. Yes, you know, you, you want to make an impression of the people that are watching you. Your customers, your clients, your future clients could all be watching you. So don't waste that five minutes of an interview. Thank you. Okay, so that was a lot. Um, so if there's any questions right now you need to ask, please do um, before we start the activity. Are there any questions? Okay, three, there's two. Um, you can start, yeah. Ladies first. <laughs> Hi guys, thank you so much for what you've imparted on us so far. It's been really, really um, informative and really helpful. The question that I have is, is more for you, Abu, and that's just around um, profitability when it comes to angel investors. So are social enterprises attractive to angel investors? And if so, what is it about a social enterprise that you would find attractive? Thank you so much for the point. So mine is with regards to the emails, right? Uh, one thing I know is that uh, most emails may go to, to spam, right? So two questions, do you actually read all the 200 emails every day, right? And when you do, what kind of subject line are you looking for so that you can actually, you know, give it that attention? Because I know if it's 200, some will just literally go into the spam and you want something that pushes you to click on the email itself. Thank you. Hi, uh, thank you very much for your time. Uh, so I just quickly want to ask you a question regarding uh, in like when you're pitching to investors with the equity, because that's always the thing. I know that scares a lot of entrepreneurs because we always want to own as much as we can in our business. Now, what in what when when you're pitching, what equity do you aim to like give away to uh, to investors? Like, is is there a standard? I'm just wanna. That's like my question. Yeah, thanks. Good afternoon. 
Um, my first question is, uh, how do you get yourself calm when you get to the stand of, uh, to the podium when you're preaching? Calm, how do you calm yourself? Because, you know, most of us, um, we're not used to standing in front of people. The moment you stand in front of people, you start getting, start shaking, like I'm shaking already right now. <laughs> we're not used to being in front. So how do you get yourself to calm? And then uh, secondly, when I get to the interview, how do I relate to you to make sure that all my points get to be thrown out? Because you know, when you start asking me questions, I get nervous as well, and I forget some of the things. How do I content myself to make sure that I give you the information exactly the way I'm supposed to do? Thank you. I'll start with that last question. So my, my, my advice is always that no one knows your business better than you. Even I don't know your business as well as you do. Think of it as that engagement that can earn you a lot of money, right? Maybe it is uh, someone that is willing to put money in your business. You, you don't have the space to be nervous, right? You just need to find techniques. If you have to meditate, before doing interviews, do the meditation exercises that you need to do. But here's a, an important part. Most of the time, the people that you are scared of, they are in their homes. They are not there watching you. They are not there with you. So there's a barrier between you and the audience. It's either the camera or, it's, in fact, most of the time, it's the camera. So one, you need to have confidence in the fact that this is your business and you own it. And if you look nervous, how can I even trust what you are saying? So your nerves cannot come into the way. You have to find ways in which you are going to have to deal with nerves for any situation so that when you come to speak about your business, you come alive. And I, as the audience, I believe immediately what you are saying. And I want to buy your product. I want to use your service. If you let fear now to take over, it's going to be difficult for me to spend my money on you. Right, and some people will be sympathetic and say, shame man, he's so nervous, shame, but I think I get what he's saying. No, but half of the, the majority of the population will not do that. So as much as you are hard on yourself about success in your business, you need to be hard on yourself about how you communicate uh, your message. So you don't have space to be, um, to be nervous. Start dealing with it, start finding issues, uh, ways to deal with it. And the, last, the first question was about it was about um, uh, how the subject line, right? It's always, if you're going to have a, a motivation, let's say you have come up with a system to, I don't know, regulate temperature, right? And it's an innovative uh, system. You'll say, um, SA entrepreneur, it will say SA entrepreneur um, launches groundbreaking uh, system, whatever, you know, just that catchy, think of a headline of a newspaper. Sometimes they're so dramatic. Make them dramatic if they need to be, so that it catches my attention, as opposed to saying interview request, because I get those a lot. So in the subject box, give me something that will say, oh, there's someone that's bringing something new? Let me click and let me see what's happening. So be as dramatic as you possibly can, but realistically, of course. Um, so, I, I guess from my perspective, I still get nervous. Um, I am turning here all the time. Uh, I, I think it does get easier with time. So, the more you do it, the easier it gets. And so, go and pitch your business 20 times before you actually get up here and pitch it. Uh, that's the first point. Second point is speak to one person at a time. Don't speak to the whole audience. Um, just you know, work your way across. But each message is to one person, and it's almost a personal conversation with that one person. And whether we were standing here or we were at my house or your house, it's the same way. I'm talking to you in the same way. Uh, and then the third thing is keep it simple. So I think someone mentioned remembering everything. I, I don't have a script that I came to this session with. I've got high-level points, and I just talk through them. Uh, and for me, those are potholes, because if I've forgotten something that I was going to say, I, I know in my mind, 
oh, you were meant to say that, and that's what my mind is focused on, and not what I'm going to say next. Um, so it, it just slows you down. That's when the ums, the ahs, and the, oh, no, I should have done that come, come about. Uh, but yeah, I, I think everyone gets nervous, or most, I do, don't know if, if you still do, yeah? Uh, we all, but we're all people. We're all humans in the end. Um, yeah, hopefully that helps. Then there was a question, sorry, I'm jumping around, but um, yeah, equity. Uh, so our average investment has been 700,000 Rand for roughly 15 to 20% of equity. It's a very layered question. So it just really depends, on, it depends. The easiest way is not value the business. Uh, let's do it via a convertible note. So a convertible note is a debt instrument. You get your money that you need to run your business today. And then we kick the valuation question down the road. And at the next valuation round, we, we let Mr. VC come and value the business. And then I get my shares for a discount to what that VC gets his shares for or her shares for. That's the easiest way. Um, I guess the technical answer to your question is there are probably eight, 10 different ways of valuing your business. Uh, and my suggestion to all founders is go and value your business based on those eight to 10 ways. There's probably five or six that are relevant to your business. There's gonna be a few that are not relevant to your business. Use those five or six. There's the, the number, the output from those five or six, there's gonna be one that's way out that way, one that's way out that way, outliers, kick them out, right? So that it, it, they're not relevant. You're left with two, three, average your valuation on those, triangulate between those two or three, get an average, and that's a, a sound basis to say, okay, I value my business at this because of this. And as a result of you giving me X, you get Y in my business. Yeah. But more often than not, we're just doing convertible notes uh, um, in the early stages of a business because your idea of evaluation is there, my idea of evaluation is there, and we're never gonna get to, to an agreement on, on somewhere in between. Yeah, so, so your objective is to just get some uh, like, like seed funding and then get the business with full potential then let a VC or let a, a proper financial provider uh, like value it and then it's at its full potential so it's actually worth X amount and then you get your equity and so forth. Uh, yeah, I actually wouldn't even say I'm looking to raise, let's for argument's sake, say I'm looking to raise 500,000 Rand and I'm willing to give away 20% or 10% of equity. I just say I'm looking to raise 500,000 Rand, and this is how I'm gonna use that money. Um, Diabo and I were talking earlier that often there's this f fallacy maybe of I'm gonna pitch tonight and I'm gonna get your money tonight. The money's gonna be in my bank account before I leave that door. It doesn't happen that way, right? It's, it is a relationship. The due diligence alone is gonna take four to six weeks for us to thoroughly assess your business. So it's, it could be months before you actually get the money, if you get the money at all. So just bear that in mind. All you're doing is you're planting a seed tonight that my business has potential and I have the potential to execute on the business. Remember that w when we invest into a young company, we're investing into the team primarily. Because that idea that you've got today is likely to pivot next week or the month afterwards. And it's only the A teams, the, the people that can execute that are not gonna give up at pivot number two or three. They will find a way. So we invest in teams primarily and then ideas secondly, yeah? There's six other things, but teams first. Uh, and so all you need to do is convince me that you are the right person to execute on this idea. And then the last question was just social ventures. Um, 
it's a question I often get asked, and it is also it depends. So, so typically, um, l let me maybe come at it from a different angle. So what I suggest all of you do is jump onto LinkedIn and go and find your ideal investor, right? It doesn't need to be an angel investor, but go and find the person that you want to be part of your company and say to them, reach out to them and say, look, I'm doing this X, Y, Z. I'd love to have a conversation with you. And it, they don't have to be an investor. They can be someone operating in and, around, in, in and around your space, but just someone that you feel could add value to your business. And often that relationship then evolves over time from an acquaintance to a mentor, from a mentor to a board member, from a board member to an investor. And, and that often is how things work. Um, uh, uh, so my suggestion is go and find someone that relates to the issue that you're trying to solve and reach out to that person. Um, so uh, going back to the earlier point that was made is know who you're pitching to, right? So find, go and do your research. And, and often we, I'm not saying we, angels don't invest in social ventures, but we are far more likely to invest if we relate to the problem that you're trying to solve. Right? So go and do your research, connect the dots for me, and then we can have a conversation. So we do invest, it just depends if we can relate to, to that particular field of work. Seems like we're going above time. Um, so Right now, I would love us to just huddle um, in groups of three. Um, so right now, what, could, what will happen is that if you have a business that's already existing, um, within that group, you can work on that business or you can create just a theoretical business. And then based on the knowledge that you've received here, you can use that and then just pitch your business for, for the investors. And then they will give you constructive feedback and then we'll close off this <laughs> event. So right now, please just group yourself in groups of three. Sorry, did you get it? Did you get a pitch deck? Uh, no, no, no. So based on the information that you received here and the pitch deck, just create a theoretical business or use your existing business and then pitch it for for the both of them uh, no 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 just talk yeah just talk so I'll give you 10 minutes so right now it's 10 past 4 so we'll be done at 20 past 4 thank you and um, actually in between the pitching and the huddle they'll just be listening in and just just listening not judging you guys at all and then you'll <laughs> you'll choose one member or two members to come forward and pitch that idea thank you
guys. Um, please note that um, you will be pitching for one minute, a one minute pitch. So just prepare for a minute pitch. Hi, Abu. Um, so there's an online question for you um, from Terence. Um, he asked, for developing ventures, some investors may ask, what's your price? What's the, significant, uh, the significance of um, having your price? How do you deter determine it? Are there alternatives to having a walkaway price? this question yeah um, I guess it's similar to the question that, that he asked but um, 
सर ठीक है गुड आई टेरेंस आई एम होपिंग आई हैव अंडरस्टूड योर क्वेश्चन करेक्टली बाय प्राइस आई एम होपिंग यू डू मीन वैल्यूएशन बट आई आंसर product price and then valuation so valuation is is really a very subjective discussion and often results in a lot of negotiation my suggestion to any startup who's looking to raise funding is go and do your own valuation use multiple methods and then triangulate or average your valuation based on the the numbers that that come out of your calculations and if we still can't agree often a fallback or a fail safe is to do a convertible note a convertible note is essentially a debt instrument that then converts to equity at some point in the future and all we're doing there is kicking the valuation question down the road if if it relates to the price of your product then i think you there are various ways of pricing your product there's cost plus there's market related there's value based I ideally you want to be in the value based element where you get a good sense of what value you are bringing to your customer's life and then valuing your business accordingly otherwise if if you don't have a sense of that just yet then go with market related look for similar products and assess what everyone else is selling their products for Hopefully I've answered your question. Um okay so it's 14 it's 1620 um should I give you just extra 1 minute just 1 minute please look at your clocks 1 minute please wrap up um then we'll ask one member from each group to just come and pitch Um okay ladies and gentlemen thank you and time is up. <laughs> so let me wait for the cameraman to face the camera here and then you go on stage maybe how many three of you two can sit there and then one can speak just so we know who's who <laughs> here. So So you, the first group can go on stage make yourself comfortable <laughs> Also
So please note that he will be um, judging you based on what an investor wants and she will judge you based on how you speak, your presentation skills. Yeah, just that. But don't worry, we won't judge you too much because it's your first, it's, it's a quick thing, you know? We just want to make sure that you guys have everything. Good afternoon. My name is Tulani Maxon Sibande, a West Preneur. West Preneur. West Preneur. West is a big problem, especially in South Africa these days, how it's handled and how we take care of it. So my solution is to combat how West is handled by educating households and everyone in South Africa how they handle their waste. By so doing, we're reducing the amount of waste that goes to the landfills. Our vision is to have zero waste to landfills. We are so passionate about the concept of reduce, reuse, recycle, repurpose, and the education of waste management in our other households. Our biggest competitors are the established recycling companies who are doing less when it comes to recycling. They are taking the waste from waste generated to the landfills. And that's where we're gonna come in and separate and educate everyone in the house while we're separating, installing infrastructure, and then at a later stage, let them separate the waste themselves. Our biggest revenue at the moment is glass. We currently recycle uh, glass or minus 10 tons of glass, and all the glass is processed and um, transported by hand. <sighs> I'm so nervous, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Hi, Team One. Um, nice presentation. Given that you were um, uh, nervous, it didn't show uh, in the initial, you know, uh, in your presentation. Just be mindful of you pacing about when you are doing your presentation. You kept on doing this. I think it's the way that you are trying to, um, I call it a clutch. We all have a clutch. A lot of people will do um, uh, or, or something or look up as they speak just to try to compose themselves okay so try to stand um, uh, stand in one place and say exactly what you said so that I can listen to you more remember earlier on Abu talked about the things that you are doing they may distract my attention as a person that's listening to you so the only thing that I picked up was a you know and I would I would have loved to hear in the beginning what your what what your need is i didn't find i didn't get a so what out of your presentation why are you here like so what okay waste printers i didn't get a so what so those were just my two points that i i i, I observed thanks so I also didn't pick up any nervousness. I thought you, uh, you spoke very well and passionately. I thought it was, you undersold yourself. You actually did a very good job. Um, just on, on the movement, if you are gonna move, it needs to be deliberate. So if you are moving, there's a transition that you're trying to express to your audience and then you move from, say, this side of the stage to that side of the stage. And in so doing, you're communicating a transition. So I start here, I talk about my problem, I then move there and I start talking about my solution, for example. From an investor's perspective, the questions I had was what makes you different? What is your value proposition? Why do your customers love you? Right? There, there are others in this space. That's the first point. The second point is a question of B2B versus B2C. South African, in the South African context, B2C is, is less profitable. The reason being is we are a small population, right, relative to other markets. We're also a very fragmented market. And the third thing is your spending power of the average consumer doesn't compare to what you'd find in other bigger markets, right? So as a result, all of those things funnel through into your business 
I mean that your earnings potential, your profit potential is diminished. B2B is a more profitable play in the South African context. And my suggestion to you is target businesses, educate them to be more wise and more conscious of the waste that they're creating. And you are the solution to helping them recycle. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Owen, and our company is called The Tech Pros. We are a bunch of crazy people who were retrenched. Unfortunately, because of COVID-19, we are IT experts, and what we have done is we've started our own company assisting companies to make sure that people are always connected at home. So the biggest challenge that we've found is that since COVID-19 has started, people are working from home, children are learning from home, but there's nobody necessarily giving tech support to those people, right? So what happens when your fiber goes off in the middle of a meeting? Who do you call? What happens when your internet goes off and your child is in the middle of an exam? Who do you call? Problematic, and that's where we come in, and that is the problem that we're trying to solve. We are the people that you call if you need service and if you need somebody to come and sort out your internet at home. Who is our client? Our client is companies like Rain, right? We've seen those companies have grown so much in the last 12 months. They've grown so fast, but unfortunately, the support infrastructure has not grown at the same pace. So they are struggling to keep their customers happy. And what happens in that regard? A lot of people end up on social media complaining. Brand reputation goes down the drain. Who do they call? They call us, we save their brands. How so? We are ready, we are deployable, we are quick. We get to people's houses in Soweto, in Soshangube, in Alexandra, we are there. There's an internet problem. I would rather our company is sorting out that problem than to be having um, Abu Kasim trying to figure out what is wrong with this internet. He gets paid a hell of a lot of money to make important decisions. He shouldn't be worrying about that. His job is to worry about running big businesses and figuring out where to invest his money. What are we looking for today? We're looking for, what's the word? In exchange of a convertible note. We're looking for exactly. We're looking for funding in exchange of convertible notes for us to be able to run our business for the next 12 months. And that would be to the value of 6 million rands. Thank you very much. my attention um, I figured out who you are and what you want and uh, so what you told me the problem and you proposed the solution um, uh, your communication style you were articulate I could hear every word that you were saying I was not distracted by anything that you were saying so I really cannot fault you on your presentation well done Yeah, well presented. I, I like the uh, articulation of the problem. It was quite clear. Um, and I like the B2B angle, which I don't know if you came up on the spur of the moment, but this was the exact point I was making a bit earlier. As an investor, uh, two points. So the first one is the problem you articulated. Is there longevity to that problem? Now, are we going to be working from home forever? Um, and if not, how does this pivot, a business then pivot and adjust to where things are going in future. That is the first thing that came to mind. The second thing is this is a services business. So um, often you would have heard the question of scalability, right? Uh, and a services business, let me take a step back. Scalability relates to the marginal cost of 
servicing one additional customer, right? So as you move from Shosanguve to Soweto to all these other neighborhoods, you're gonna need more people. The bottleneck in the process becomes the people. And you're just gonna need more and more. And unfortunately that makes you not scalable. So these big consulting firms, Accenture, McKinsey, BCG, they're big companies, but they're not scalable in the way that we think of scalable. The average cost or the marginal cost of that additional customer is an additional consultant. And in the same way for you, the business is unfortunately not scalable. We prefer products to services because they tend to be scalable. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Cassandra. Hi, I'm, I'm Aaron. And I'm Joseph. And we are 123 Tutors. Thank you so much for coming to our pitch. So today, we're going to be talking about a problem that most parents have, which is getting a reliable tutor at the snap of a finger. Nowadays, your child is struggling with an assignment, is struggling with homework. You're at home, you're trying to solve your problems. We have created a solution where you're able to go through a platform that is seamless and able to request a tutor that is recruitable, and you don't have to go through the process of vetting a million tutors. One thing we have noticed nowadays with most platforms, you have to go on a platform, go through a list of 10 tutors, and go through the problem of deciding who's the best tutor, right? We let the crowd decide. Most of our students have rated our tutors, therefore, we give you a list of tutors that have been vetted, that have been proven by the community, so that when you get a request, you're rest assured that your child is in good hands. So what makes one, two, three tutors different? Is it cheaper, is it more affordable? Yes, it is. We work with university students, as you know, they're industry experts within a specific subject, and we're able to price our products at a very low margin without having to price at the same price that we have traditionally in traditional uh, tutoring companies. We have a platform that works online, therefore reducing overheads, and therefore that we're able to reduce the price that you pay for your tutoring services. At the end of the day, what we have is a platform that gives you peace of mind knowing that you're requesting from a database of vetted tutors that have gone through the process that your students have gone through and you're not getting someone who claims to know the problem, who claims to have solved the problem, but you are rest assured that we are going to help you improve your results in a short space of amount of time without the hassle of worrying whether um, I have to vet and go through the process of clearing this uh, individual that I bring into my home. Right now, one to three tutors has been operating for four years. In the past year, we achieved a revenue mark of 1.3 million rands. And right now, we're just looking for investors that can help you take it a step further. Let more parents enjoy our services. Let more countries enjoy our services. One to three tutors. One, two, three tutors should have its own show. Because, Woo! you know, <laughs> look, you kept me glued and I was hearing everything that you were saying. And I loved your emphasis on the fact that um, you highlighted the problem at the first go about every parent who has school going children, they're looking for tutors. And I'm thinking, yes, I actually am looking for tutor, um, a tutor for my child. And then you say, this is the solution. And you, you, you gave me comfort um, in telling me about that you have vetted your tutors and what the industry currently looks like. Um, you, I was not distracted in any way. I love your use of um, hand gestures. I thought you were um, trying to, you know, um, try to rather um, curate them in such a way that you use them when you want to emphasize a point rather than using them throughout your entire talk. 
you know sometimes you really just want you to you want to keep your hands to yourself so that i concentrate on your eyes because when i start looking at your hands and they are uh, wavering maybe a lot a little more than usual i start to concentrate on that and look at that like those hands at those hands and I, I forget what you said maybe there's an important sentence that you said so be mindful of your gestures every now and then you want to keep your hands to yourself I will, in, um, in the previous uh, session you mentioned about being deliberate if you are going to be walking about you did not do that much of that you stood in one place it was just the hand gestures but your communication style I was hearing you I was hearing what you and I heard what you saw what is so well done you guys did very well nice Thanks. So as you, as you were talking through that, uh, I think the one question that came to mind was the other tutoring companies, what makes you different? And I'm glad you answered that as, as you went through it. The questions that come to mind now uh, just relate to some of the detail that you probably, just time didn't permit you to go into. So the questions that come up now are, what is your acquisition strategy? How do you go about acquiring new customers, new, new parents to then service? Um, the point I made earlier just about B2C being fragmented, being the buying power, be, uh, being a challenge, being a small population, those are things that we need to think about now as well. And it's probably something that you've considered and positioned your product accordingly. The other thing that comes to mind is a marketplace. So the tech is actually the easiest thing in a marketplace, right? Um, you could do it on a spreadsheet and a phone. The, the challenging thing with a marketplace is the scale, getting to market. And I like the you presented your metrics, revenue, quite nicely. There's a book, uh, Lean, I think it's Lean Analytics. It talks through different metrics that you should consider being different types of companies. An e-commerce company has a certain set of metrics that it should track. A marketplace has a certain uh, set of metrics that it should track. My suggestion is, uh, and, and I can maybe share it with my is, is th there's a list, and I can't think of them offhand, of metrics that a marketplace should track. One of them is the size of your database, because the size of your database like WhatsApp, right? If WhatsApp could be the best solution, but if no one's using it, the value to me is nothing. It's only valuable to me because I can communicate with X, Y, Z. The same with your marketplace. If only at scale does it become valuable to me. So just think through those other metrics. Like I said, time didn't permit you to go into some of the detail. I thought you presented well. And everything I expected, you to present on, you did within the time you, that was permitted. So, thank you very much for participating and I hope that everyone learned a thing or two and you got a lot of value as you expected. And thank you for to our virtual audience as well and for the questions. Thank you, unfortunately you couldn't participate but it's okay. Um, we will share the, these documents as well online if maybe these ones get lost or something. And this will also be um, uploaded on YouTube and you can go on our website to just go over it again um, whenever you're free. And we'll have another startup panel next month, um, the last Thursday of the month. So usually we have this every Thursday of every month. So um, just stay on our social media pages. Um, Jen22 on Sloan Instagram, <laughs> 22 on Sloan Twitter, 22 on Sloan LinkedIn, and um, 22 on Sloan uh, on Facebook. Um, thank you very much for joining us and we hope you travel safe and stay safe. Thank you.
Thank you. 